All right. Well, Matt Dobshoots, welcome to the program. Thanks, Jonathan. Glad to glad to be here. Yeah, I was grateful for a, a mutual connection of ours that was that that gave me your name, and and I was excited to uh, get a copy of your your book here entitled "Porn Free: Becoming the Type of Man Who Does Not Look at Porn." And I'm I want our conversation today to really revolve around what you've put into that book. But before we get into some of those specific questions, uh, can you just share with our listeners maybe some of how you got to this space where you're writing a book like that and you've got a podcast with that same title, Porn Free Podcast. Just give us a little bit of the backstory it's, of how you got to It's actually Porn this. Free Radio. Porn Free Radio, yeah, yeah. It's actually Porn Free Radio. Okay. So Pure Sex Radio. Um, I don't know. I have a joke that maybe would work for your audience. Um, a lot of times guys sheepishly tell me that they were in the podcast app you know, maybe being a little naughty, looking for something, and then I pop up. Right. And so, you know, and I say, hey, you know what? We've found that 50% of the guys who find Porn Free Radio were actually doing just what you were doing. And the other 50% lie about how they found it. Right. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, we've had a lot of... So uh, you could use that. We've had a lot I'm of guys sure, find I'm us sure. that weren't looking for us originally. Yeah. Exactly. I love that. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I host a podcast called Porn Free Radio, and and uh, it documents a little of my recovery from porn, um, but it's really become a community effort in terms of getting a lot of feedback from the listeners and getting feedback from uh, some of the coaching groups I run. Uh, and it's just become kind of this thing now where we're sharing resources, books, ideas with one another, and... Um, you know, I think it was probably, it was probably like the, you know, you've done hundreds of episodes. I think it was at like the twenties when I started getting email and started getting feedback from people listening. And that's when the podcast really took off. That's when it really started. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just me just riffing or giving advice. It became something more. So yeah. it, uh, more community a- aspect. And, and now I kind of feel like I just reflect the community in some ways. That's great. So obviously you had a, a personal story that got you into this into this space. And I, and some of it, you, you weave it throughout the book as well in terms of some of that. Um, can you give us a, a little bit, maybe kind of, I used to say the Reader's Digest version, but if anybody's under 40, they don't know what that means. So I used to say, can you give us the Twitter version of your, your story um, and how you got to a place of, well, being a man who, a type of man who does not look at porn. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, like a lot of guys who grew up in the, the late seventies, early eighties, I discovered porn in magazines. I, I first saw it. I, I later stole it. Uh, when I got a little older and moved out, I rented it. Uh, and then, uh, was a very early adopter of the internet. I remember reading sex stories on like a, almost like a bulletin board, not even, you know, even before pictures. And, um, and except at the same time, I grew up in a Christian home and I was a, I was a strong Christian. And so I always had this sort of divided life where I felt like this doesn't match my faith. It, it, it kind of is a disconnect and it was very confusing because I, you know, really was drawn to porn and curious about it and almost compulsively going back to it. But then I would, uh, I was always a kind of a binge and purge type person. If I had a magazine, I acted out with it, boom, it would be like, I'd throw it away. Um, (laughs) One of the hardest things about, you know, being being a Christian and and then struggling is I, I kept throwing away all the porn and then I wouldn't have it, (laughs) which would always create another problem uh, when I was trying to go back to it. And, and, um, so I kind of went through that cycle for years. Uh, I would tell people about it every once in a while. And, and just, I think because I was such an early adopter, it was before everyone had phones and all the stuff that that's available now. A lot of times people were really confused by it. They were like, they didn't even understand how I got porn. I remember telling a small group leader once that I was looking at porn on my computer and he's like, you mean like where you get your email? Like he didn't even have a, it wasn't even like in the, uh, you know, it wasn't even front of mind sure, yeah. you know, that, that, that was a possibility. 
uh, when I, you know, when I was struggling. So uh, I, I'll do the R Reader's Digest fast forward uh, Instagram story version of this. Uh, so, you know, I, like a lot of guys, got married, married a strong Christian woman. Um, you know, we had, uh, she was in ministry, so we had a, a really pure dating relationship. But, you know, I just assumed once I got married that it would sort of fix some of these, some of the draw to porn. Mm -hmm. But actually the intimacy of marriage and the depth of emotion that my wife experiences versus my very capped off lack of emotion uh, really scared me and, and kind of even pushed me deeper into secrecy and, and using porn because I think I wasn't prepared emotionally to be married like at that deep core level mm. um so but it was there was a gracious thing that happened two years into marriage um after a matt redmond conference i actually mentioned this in the book yeah. a, you know a christian conference i you know we were all on a spiritual high i get home my wife didn't feel good she goes to bed and i hit the office to i i don't know if i was trying to chase the spiritual high or if i just had been with people too long that that weekend at the conference but i just got on the computer and did what i always did i started going down the rabbit hole and and uh and she woke up that night and came in the office stood at the door and said what are you doing and there i was and it was like obvious what i was doing i, I was i was on a funny podcast once um uh with a, a christian woman who teaches christian women about positive sexuality and and she said you were caught red-handed, and I go, "Oh, that's a really weird yeah. way to say it." But, but it, it was, yeah. There was no hiding, and I was sitting, there, you know, naked in front of the computer, basically. So, mm -hmm. um, so that led to kind of me opening up and kind of exposing some of my hidden world. And my wife said, "You know, I know this isn't about me." She said this that night. I know this isn't about me, but you need help. And uh, and it just happened that there was a kind of a Christian uh, discipleship ministry that had to do with sexual and relational issues that was running um, periodically throughout the year. And uh, I just signed up for it, interviewed, and, and went to the group. And And that group started opening me up to just my needs, uh, opening up to some of the stuff that happened to me growing up, uh, some of the... Um, just some of the lies I believed about myself. And, um, and so that kind of started the, the ball rolling, mm -hmm. but it still was difficult to break free from porn. It still kind of was, uh, it took a number of, um, tools and things to kind of, kind of start to, to turn the corner with porn and to, to, to really turn the corner with secrecy. You know, I think I think I had just gotten I, I had really created this habit of secrecy and being divided, showing one thing to people and having this internal world. And that was hard to break because um, I still wanted to look good. I still wanted to be loved. I still wanted to be, a, you know, I didn't want to look bad. And so I think I was that kind of was still early on in my recovery. That was a big challenge. Yeah. Well, let's let's dive into uh, the book, and I've got some questions that I want to to ask you so that uh, we can kind of walk our our listeners through some of the the key principles and things that you highlight in the book that I think are really helpful for again becoming the type of man who does not look at porn. Um, your first chapter, you actually start by talking about being alone. Why did you start there in the book? <laughs> I um. I, I don't know. I guess I realized I always struggled with being alone. Um, not, not just cause I, you know, wanted to act out or things like that, but I just, I always felt a certain sense of loneliness in my life. And, and porn was like this sort of weird escape from my feelings of aloneness. And, um, um, and you know, I, I, I have a quote in the book that it took me a long time to source, but it, um, it it's comes from Thomas Merton. He says something like, by means of distraction, a man could avoid his own company 24 hours a day. And I, that was really me. I was always looking for a way to escape myself. And I think there was some pain. There was some, uh, uh, there was an internal feeling of feeling unlovable. 
that I kind of carried around with me. And when I got alone, that 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 got louder. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just remember sometimes coming home, even when I was a single guy, coming home on Friday night, walking into my apartment. I lived alone, shutting the door and going, "Now what?" Like here I am alone, and I would, it would, I don't know. So th- so that's the that was my starting point. Yeah, um, I really feel. Like a lot of porn, I mean, it, you'll probably ask a question about this, but you know, I, I say in the book over and over this idea that porn is sort of a solution versus a problem. And what I mean is my problem was this, this sense of aloneness that I carried around and this feeling of being unlovable. And porn was the distraction and the escape from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so many guys, you know, whether they can identify specifically with the aloneness, you'd have to say that every guy that gets hooked on porn struggles with some kind of dividedness in his being, right? Whether whether he's being distracted or like you said you couldn't be alone with yourself, you had a uh, so there's always going to be some kind of isolating, you know, act, uh component of that. And you do so speaking about porn being a solution, you do mention that, you know, one of your coaching clients had come to you and said, you know, I want to hate porn. And that sounds good on the front end, right? Like, oh yeah, I want to hate porn because you know porn is bad. Porn is bad. But why? Why was this request maybe the wrong approach to frame out what the journey is going to look like for him, or or what he needed to be focused on? Why is the idea of just saying I want to hate porn maybe the wrong focus? Well, I <laughs> he actually asked me. He wanted me to teach him how to hate porn. It wasn't that he just wanted to hate porn. He wanted somehow me to teach him to hate it. And I I think the simple idea here is a lot of guys think, well, it would be easier to quit if I just hated this thing. If I really didn't like it, if I learned to not like it and find it disgusting, it would be easy to say no to the same way. Like, um, have you ever been a smoker? No. Okay. Well, me either. I have like allergies and a little bit of asthma. Right. So the idea of smoking is kind of already disgusting to me. Like it just, so how hard would it for me to be, to quit cigarettes? It wouldn't be hard at all because I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's easy to quit things we don't like. <laughs> um, it's, but it, the harder challenge is to quit things that we really like and that serve a need for us. And, and that's, again, back to the solution idea. This guy, you know, he wanted me to teach him how to hate it so it would be easier to quit it. And I think that's just, that's a waste of your, our energy. Mm-hmm. Our, it's, it's really a waste of our energy. And, and I see this a lot. Um, you know, there's plenty of great resources out there. I mean, your podcast, there's lots of podcasts. And, and there's a lot of these guys that kind of tie the mission of, letting guys get free from porn with sort of an anti-porn advocacy thing, you know, like, you know, the porn industry Mm -hmm. and kind of being advocates and stuff. And it's like that to me doesn't help anyone quit. I don't think. Yeah. It it just tries to make porn and porn industry, the enemy. And that's a good thing. That's not a, I'm not opposed to that, but that's not my mission. My mission is how do I take something that I know is not good for me, but that I've, escaped to used over and over created a relationship with how do i shift out of that and so that guy i was just uh, the way i say it in the book is i said um you know i asked the guy you know you're down in texas i said do you like dr pepper and and the kid the kid was like i don't know maybe i guess yeah i go well i love dr pepper you know and but part of my physical fitness and some of my stuff i i i don't want to drink soda anymore I don't want to drink, you know, and, and so I had to kind of let go of Dr. Pepper, but I still love the taste of it. Mm-hmm. If you gave me a Dr. Pepper and made me drink it right now, I would still like it. It, it liking it doesn't help me let go of it. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, not like, you know, you know that, so that was kind of the idea that I had. Well, even as you start to try to even reframe, uh, the issue from seeing porn as a problem to something that you've used as a solution, is there are there, is there a better approach? Is there a better way to actually frame how we are going to address our lust and porn struggles? How would you try to coach a guy in that or help him to have a different framework for pursuing freedom? 
Well, I mean, what I like to do with the guys that I work with is is invite them to be curious about what the real problem is. If, 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 if they buy into what I say, that porn is a solution, if they can start to shift and start to see it that way as not the root of all their problems, but as the escape of their problems. Um, uh, I, I'll give you one quick example. A lot of times I'll say, hey, what does porn cost you? And someone will say, well, I, it's cost, I've, I've been depressed and I have anxiety and this and that. And I go, wait a second, wait a second. So did porn cause the anxiety and the depression? Or was an escape for it? And then they go, hmm, boy, no, I think I felt this first. Then I went to porn. Then I just felt worse. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, <laughs> it, it, and, and I go, oh, well, that's interesting. So the depression or the porn or, or the boredom or the anxiety was already there. And porn just kind of, you know, made it more muddy and, you know, created other problems, you know. Um, so what I do is I like to invite people to think of, well, what are those emotional triggers in your life? What are the things that you get stuck on that you want to escape, numb, uh, avoid? What are some of those needs in your life that are going unmet? And, and porn is kind of an unskillful way of meeting those needs. You know, maybe it's feeling powerful or, uh, maybe it's feeling angry about something where, where, where you're being overlooked or someone's not appreciating you and, and this is a way you're trying to be appreciated uh, for me I realized a lot of my porn use was trying to get nurture or comfort um, I didn't even realize I was looking for that it, it, it just was so automatic that's the thing mm -hmm. about you know uh, an addiction is this idea that everything becomes sort of automatic I feel something, I'm not even aware of what I'm feeling, and I'm going to a behavior. Yeah, you know, sometimes, so the, the, for me, yeah, yeah, I think sometimes ahead. people, uh, some, some people are familiar with the term dry drunk. So the idea that, you know, somebody has not been drinking alcohol, but yet all of the negatives about what they bring to a relationship or what they bring to their attitude and what they bring to their work, it's as if, all of that stuff is still there, even though they're not drinking. And I'm hearing you say kind of a similar thing. It's like, okay, let's say we actually did eliminate porn. And we've seen this in guys before. They're not looking at pornography anymore. And six months later, their wives are calling us and saying, why is my husband still a jerk? Like, <laughs> why is he still angry all the time? Why is he still, you know, disconnected and aloof? And it's like, well, because like you said, porn wasn't the problem. Porn was the solution that he was going to, to try to numb the problem or try to find escape yeah I, I i ask a question really similar i said hey if i had a magic wand and i could take porn out of your life what would we need to work on and some guys have told themselves this story over and over that if they just didn't use this use porn or do this behavior that they would have the lives they wanted the meaning they needed, you know, the, the, the wonderful marriage, the ministry, whatever it else. And I'm like, that's not true. Mm -hmm. It's just not true. There's a reason you're using porn. And, 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 and it's like, that's, I mean, that's why I used it, right? I used it to escape, to numb, to hide, uh, to, 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 to manage uncomfortable feelings. Yeah. And the, the way out of it is to learn the, sc the, the skills and tools to, to, to actually manage my life without using porn. So what would you say is the, the goal of recovery? How would you try to describe that? Boy, you know, you asked me some of these questions in the pre thing, and I go, God, I got to read this book again. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know um, but I, one, one, one idea that I had that came out in the book um, that it, it has to do with the, the, my definition of addiction. So I, the way that I define addiction um, comes from a guy named Thomas Horvath. Uh, uh, he's a psychologist in California. And he just says that addiction is just an extreme version of a habit. Now, there's some costs. He, he recognizes there's some costs and there's some craving tied to it. But at the end of the day, it is a, just a very ingrained habit. And the way, that you the way that you get free of an addiction is to change your habits the same way you change a habit. 
Um, so one of the definitions for recovery that I like to use is that recovery is the transformation of our habits. It's the process where we start looking at these you know, seemingly automatic habits that come out in addiction behaviors and transferring them to intentional habits that we're creating that actually meet the needs and solve the real problems. Mm -hmm. How important is, is a connection to community or learning how to actually engage authentic community? How important is that to the whole process of breaking free from porn? Well, I haven't had, um, you know, a lot of other addiction stuff that I've worked through. You know, I, I, I wasn't a gambler. Um, I haven't had a drug problem or drug habit. I like habit is a better, you know, better than addiction. Um, you know, I haven't had a habit with drugs or smoking. So I don't know what the relational needs are for those to, to recover from those habits. But for me, I think it's so obvious that so many of the needs I was looking for in porn were relational. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not, not feeling, feeling known or seen, um, not feeling alone, feeling nurture, comfort, love, affirmation, right? So many of the things that pulled me to pornography were that. And I talk to guys all the time who feel the same thing. Well, here's the thing. How am I gonna get those needs met just hitting the gym in the morning by myself or just reading scripture by myself and, and writing in a journal. Not that those are bad things. Those are great habits, mm -hmm. but do they meet some of those deeper relational needs that I've been trying to meet with porn? And that, and, and that's where, you know, one of the ideas that I come up with in the book is that we have to map our habits, meaning we need to find out not only the needs that we have, and uh, or the or the things we're trying to escape but we need to find the right habits to solve those problems mm -hmm. you know i was t i was t I, I don't know if i mentioned this in the book or not but i was working with a marathon runner and he we identified he didn't have any friendships or any relationships and i said well what do you do with your self-care how do you get self-care well of course what did he do he ran, he ran yeah <laughs> He ran by him and ran, and I said, do you run with people or a group? No, 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 I couldn't run with, some, I couldn't train with someone else because I have to keep my pace and I have to do this. So all of his investment in self-care was in this sol solitary activity, yet his biggest need was co connection mm -hmm. and not having relationships. So one of the things we did with his plan was he had on Sunday night to go get a beer with somebody. That was like his, <laughs> that was like his commitment because we knew he was gonna run, he was gonna get his hours running. Yeah. <laughs> but he wasn't getting any of that intentional connection in, in his life. So if, if recovery or, or freedom is really the, the transformation of habits, what would be some of the first critical steps that a person, that a guy would need to take in order to move towards freedom and wholeness? Well, I like, I mean, one of the things I, I talk about in the book at the end of the book, and, and I talk about this on my podcast a lot is I like helping guys kind of come up with a why statement first, like really get cl internal clarity of why they're moving towards this. It's not about just behavior management. It's not about making your wife happy. Um, there has to be some internal motivation to transform because at the end of the day, you're the only one on the inside. You're the only one who can take ownership for this. And so if you don't have an internal reason, if you're just doing things for some sort of external thing or the way it looks or the, what someone else wants, it'll be easy to let go of. It won't, you know, it won't drive you. So I, I like to kind of help guys come up with an idea of what that is. And, mm -hmm. um, and, the, and one of the ways that the, the ways that I like to do that is I like to talk about what has this relationship with porn cost you. Uh, now, while I say it's a solution, I know that there's costs. There's a there's an uh, there's there's an amount of life that's exchanged for uh, a com uh, you know compulsively using pornography. So, what is being given up in in this struggle? Now, for me, one of the things that I realized is my struggle uh, was was. Uh, it, it was continually reinforcing the lie that I was unlovable. That, you know, every time I went to porn and grabbed for porn, I was basically saying, hey, I need porn to make me feel good enough. 
and and that reinforced the idea that I'm unlovable. I'm I'm broken. Not not in your good way. You know, be broken is in your way broken and contrite. You know. Well, we use it as a songs. double meaning. The, there's like there's like the I, brokenness that leads you to to the point where you say I need help, and then there's the brokenness that grows you because you humble yourself before God and others. You know, so. <laughs> right, right. So I I I I, I like that. Uh, I like your the way you do, uh, kind of reframe that and and, and grab that psalm. Um, but for me, it's like I was walking around with this feeling of being unlovable, and um, and I realized my use of porn essentially said yeah you are unlovable and that's why you need this woman on the screen to somehow make you feel good mm. enough i remember uh this is just a few years ago my wife went to bed early and i usually always go to bed with her that's one of the habits that i created back in you know 2001 when i first got in recovery but this night she went to bed super early like 8 8 p.m or something and i was like i'm not going to bed um and I was just watching TV, and I don't normally do this. We, we always watch, like, appointment TV. Like, we are watching a show together, or we have something taped. Um, I, I don't really even know where the channels are anymore, but I just started channel, channeling up, and I land on a celebrity show with these pretty celebrities, and I just watch it for about f a few minutes. And I catch myself being drawn in by this one female celebrity. Like, oh, she's so pretty, and... Oh, she's shopping, and oh, isn't this interesting? And my mind is just kind of like attaching myself to her in this little, uh, this little scene. No, nothing was sexual, so to speak. I mean, there wasn't any nudity or anything like that. It just I was, I, but I was kind of drawn into this fantasy of watching this TV show, and then it caught me. Oh, you are agreeing with the lie that you're unlovable right now. You feel slightly rejected that your wife went to bed. You're mad because you're home. You're alone again, and all of a sudden, here you are, get, watching this TV show, getting drawn in, and you're wanting this woman and her prettiness and her her personality and her body to somehow make you feel good enough. And I turn off the TV. Why did I turn off the TV? Was it out of piety? Was it out of fidelity to my wife? Uh, no. It was because I don't want to agree with the lie that I'm unlovable. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Simple as that. I, I I think I went and read a book. Yeah. And again, I'm not I'm not like I, I mean I believe me I many times I went the other direction for years I would struggle and act out and get in all these scrapes but now that internal reason that why is the thing that kind of pulls me into the behavior I want to create. But that so that's the first. Uh, that was a really long answer. Sorry, sorry, Jonathan. No problem. Um, I, uh, but that—that's kind of the, that's where I like to start. I like to start with the why, yeah. and then I like to start with what are those big, you know, what are those big emotional things that you, that you have trouble managing? What are those repeated situations that keep leading you down the rabbit hole? You know, the the things that are really fueling and driving the behaviors. That's what I like to go for next. Yeah, well, it's so important to cast vision early because it, I think you're right. So many guys can get so focused on just eliminating a behavior or just behavior modification that they can't see the broader picture of how their life can be different. Um, you know, one of the things where you where you start to kind of take the book is you you then start talking about self care. What is self-care and how important is that to a guy's recovery from porn? Boy, I gotta I gotta reread this book. Um the uh <laughs> Don't you love uh, that? It's like, wow, you you're sitting there and going, Man, this is a really good book. I should I should probably get this book, and you're the author. <laughs> uh no, yeah, so well, here here's here's what it comes down to. And it was interesting. I asked uh some of the groups I run. This is maybe as I was writing the book, I asked them, how do they define self-care? And I thought they were going to talk about habits, like, you know, whatever, exercising and journaling. And I thought they were going to answer sort of these behaviors. But all of them, and I, I did this in multiple groups, had this theme of self-kindness. Mm. And, and so I think at the core of any habit that you create, that, that is related to self-care, the core is treating yourself with kindness. And, and honestly, I think in, in specifically in addiction, 
we're very quick to create behavior modification and consequences and and you know especially when there's a wife who has trauma going on i mean it's a real mess but what creates long-term freedom what creates sort of that um that emotional core that's able to sort of lean into this discomfort it comes from self-kindness it comes from not self-rejection right i i self-rejected myself for years with this unlovable thing right i would feel unlovable when i was in front of the tv going down the rabbit hole and then what was interesting is when then then when i had to confess or go to my accountability partner my wife well i would basically tell a story about how i acted out and how horrible i was and i would basically say see i, I, I am unlovable and here's the proof because i just looked at porn and i i said i wasn't going to and i did um and and so it takes a lot to to shift into this idea of wow yeah this porn thing really upsets my wife and yes this is not something i want to be doing and but I cannot just beat myself over the head with shame. That's not going to help me ultimately get the long-term freedom I'm looking for. I need to start by going, what am I really needing? Mm -hmm. um, I know this is a, the, you, you guys talk more about theology and, 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 and uh, Christian stuff on this podcast than my podcast. My podcast is a little more open uh, to uh, kind of a common grace approach to, to porn. But I was thinking about this last night when I was thinking about talking to you. I was thinking about the way that Jesus responds to the woman at the well. And, you know, he kind of speaks to her in truth and he kind of cleverly says, hey, go get your husband. And she goes, I don't have a hus husband. And he goes, yeah, you're right. You don't. You have five husbands or you've had five husbands. But he doesn't say, well, you know, you, you have this husband problem. Let's, let's figure this out, you know, and let's get you on a... <laughs> on a whatever, a husband freedom plan, <laughs> uh, he invites her to this idea of, of looking at what her thirsts are. What are the deeper thirsts within her? What is this, John 4? Am I, uh, is it John? Yeah, I think it is in John. I'm not sure what chapter, though. Yeah, I think it's John 4. I, I could be wrong. John 4, I think. I, I, but anyway, the idea is he invites her to this relationship, and then he invites her to this idea of, like, worship and about getting your... Um, you know, the, the spring of living water that will, will quench your long-term thirst, right? You'll, it, it's not just a one drink thing. It's something that quenches the, the longer thirst, you know? And, and I think there's something to that about self-care where it's like, we're coming at, um, we're coming at the truth out of kindness, just like Jesus is inviting the woman at the well to look at her deeper thirst. That's how we need to come to ourselves and treat ourselves with some gentleness, um, not not a lack of ownership or not not taking action, but but from that place is where we need to start. Yeah, that's great. Well, well Matt, this is I mean, we could go on and on. This has been a really great conversation. Um, what what would you say to the guy out there that is just he's struggling to come out of the dark? He's struggling to come out of his secrets. He's trying to figure out how can I get the courage to take that bold first step? And then where can where can guys get uh, the book and more more resources from you? Wait, so that's two questions, right? What what can a guy do? Yeah, just kind of what encouragement would you have for that guy that's out there that's listening and maybe he's kind of listening, you know. He's listening secretly to this podcast, or he's just struggling with like, I have not come out, I've not addressed this openly, I've I've not taken that next step. I am, I can identify with that binge purge cycle, and I just need some encouragement to know what it's going to take for me to get free. Well, my first podcast, episode one that I did in 2014, was called Coming Clean, and it was very prescriptive. It basically said you know, listen to this podcast and then tell someone about your struggle. And, and I don't think that's a, I still don't think that's bad advice. Um, but a lot of guys I think went right to their wives and just, you know, vomited all right. their, their stuff out and that caused problems. Um, so, so my thing, um, uh, what I would say now is 
Um, I mean, I think the book's a good place to start or, you know, the, the, my podcast is a good place to start. The idea would be start getting a vision for what it looks like to recover. Mm. Start getting some hope first and then look for some safe people to connect with. And this could be someone at church. This could be a friend. And at first you might just have to, you might just have to take a risk and explain some of the struggle that you're having. The person may or may not be able to help you, but I found that even early in my recovery, um, you know, I don't know if I told this story in the book, but you know, there was a, uh, the, the group I went to, the recovery group I went to, you had to sign a no alcohol policy. You, you could, in the nine months of the program, you couldn't have any alcohol. And so I go to a happy hour with work and I was in software programming. And so I'm with all these programmers and they're all at the bar and they all get beer and I get a Sprite. And it was the most conspicuous thing. I'm a guy from Chicago. You know, people get, a, you know, people, people have beer at happy hour. You know, it's a pretty normal thing. And I specifically, they would know, they knew that it was out of character for me to not have beer. And the guy said, why aren't you having uh, beer dauber that's my nickname dauber and i said and i had a choice like i could play it off like oh i'm just not drinking right now or whatever but i said you know well i, I i've been struggling with pornography i've been going to this group i had to sign this thing and um and you know i'm with a bunch of software programmers so it's like you know pretty much everyone looks at porn <laughs> or most of them and a couple of the guys were sheepish and didn't want to talk about it. Guys change the subject if they don't want to talk sure, about it. Sure, yeah. But a couple of guys were like, well, tell me more about the group that you're going to. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a, you know, I think there's some, some um, uh, there's, there's gains to be had to being just honest um, mm -hmm. with people who are safe in your life. So where can guys get the book and just more information about the resources that you have? Well, the book is at um, obviously Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, it's available in a lot of booksellers around the world. Um, I, I, I actually distributed it through two different things, so you know you can order it in Australia and the UK, and uh, uh, and it's in a lot of the Kindle stores around. You know, all the Amazon Kindle stores. It's on Audible, um, so so you can get it just about anywhere where you, where you could order a book from. Uh, and then the podcast is, you know, anywhere you can listen to a podcast, Porn Free Radio. Uh, and then my website's called recoveredman.com. I used to have pornfreeradio.com, but it had a lot of trouble with email delivery. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. so I changed it to Recovered Man. It, 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 it took me a while to try to figure something else out. And, uh, and Recovered Man is kind of kind of my uh where people can find out about me. Uh, what, what I'm actually known for now um, through the podcast is I run these things called Rev Groups. And um, the Rev Groups, I think, have a better name than Recovered Man. It just, it just happened to be that's what I, the, my, my site is. So Yeah. Well, Matt, thanks for, thanks for being with us today and, and writing the book and just uh, putting yourself out there to, to help other men uh, break free. We've, we've been grateful to have you on the program today. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jonathan. You bet. Well, listeners, we're always glad that you're with us. And if you've got more questions or just need more help along the way, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to, uh, to help you take your next steps on your journey to freedom. And we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio Program. Take care. Hey.